So products 101. These are our cur for, uh, currently our four products. Student, which is a student information system. Financials, research administration, and our business continuity planning product ready. Along the bottom, you see what used to be called RICE. That's now called Kuali Core. Kuali Cores is a set of independent services that were, that were, as I mentioned in the last session, that we're building to support all of the different products. These will mostly, in fact, all, I, th I, think, all, I think that's true, will be available for standalone. So if you just want to use the auth service, or if you just want to use the workflow service, you'll be able to use those independent services. Okay? So really, there's five products. Okay? There will also be two more that we know of. And we won't start planning or thinking about those till next year, but they're HR and library systems. Okay? This is just a sampling of the community. You've already seen this, but we've got 100, 150 people that are using the products today. Most of those are in the cloud. Many of those are on premise. We support and embrace both of those. In, us, in order for us to have a thriving open source community, you have to have both. You have to have people that are running it in the cloud as well as people who are running it on premise. I think that's a, it's an important part of our value proposition. These are, as we've showed before, these are our new cloud customers that are using the product. I'm not going to spend a lot of time on this. But as I mentioned, we've been doing, we've been signing on about one a month, and it's now moved to two a month uh, of, of, of new cloud customers. And that will continue to accelerate because there's so much interest right now in, in quality software. These are our four principles of product. First is built for higher ed specifically. And that's important. We're not going to go to the corporate market. It's, we're a higher ed focused um, uh, product company. Two is really great design, which we talked about before. Three is the idea of continuous delivery. And fourth is it's a low risk proposition because it's open source. So if you think about our products, all four of them have that, the, that they share that benefit. So this is a slide I, I talked to before, but I wanted to open this up for questions. So let me just remind you how this works. You've got the Kuali Cloud, where we're shipping new value and new features on a, several times a week. And that's happening today. Our research product ships about twice a week. The student product ships sometimes three or four or five times a week, sometimes twice a day. New value. When a new feature is available, it goes in immediately. Then our applications are on the bottom left. They're using APIs in order to access the cloud, okay? You have access to the same APIs, so you can write your own applications against those same APIs. And we're delivering value. It doesn't break your code because you're using our APIs. And then you make feature requests to us, and you can either make feature requests by being part of a foundation project, or you can make feature requests by being a cloud customer. In both of those cases, you can talk to us about feature requests. We develop the code and then we send it back down. Are there any questions about that process, about continuous delivery? If not, I have some in my mind that you're probably thinking and may not want to bring up. OK, question number one. What about testing? How do you make sure that, that everything gets tested? I wrote a blog post on this, and it's a, it's a really important concept. The idea is that when you write code and you save it up, I used to work at Microsoft. And our release schedule was 18 months to two years, right? When you release new code two years from the time that you wrote it, the developer is typically gone or on a different project. Or if they are still there, they don't even remember the code that they wrote. So batching up into big projects makes it difficult to debug. And that's why you have to do, we would do a, a one-year test cycle. So we develop for a year to a year and a half, and then we'd test it for nine months to a year because we were testing. You spent all much time at the end testing the product that you just built. A lot of these new companies like LinkedIn and like Twitter and like Facebook and like Google and like Amazon, they're moving to the idea of continuous delivery. When you develop a feature, you immediately go live with that feature. So you're, you, you, what, you, you are very aware of the scope that you've touched. So if there's a problem, you can immediately back it out or immediately fix it. So the risk of delivery is way lower because you're doing one feature at a time instead of saving up tons and tons of features. 
The other, the other thing that's really important for this process is automated testing. So we do a ton of automated testing. So whenever somebody checks in code, here's the process. I write the code. I check in the code. Automated tests run when I check in the code. If any automated tests fail, developer gets their hand slapped because it means they didn't run their own automated test before they checked in. So developer runs their own automated, automated tests, they check in. The system runs automated tests, make sure that everyone's cl everything's clear. Before that ever happens, I forgot to mention, we do what's called a pull request. What that means is when I check in the code, I don't check it in directly, I do what's called a pull request. And what that means is, that's, a, that's, that's terminology that's kind of nerdy, what that means is it's waiting for someone to review it. So it can't go into the code base until a second person actually reviews the code. So every single line of code that goes in gets pull requested. So no code goes in without at least two pair of eyes reviewing it. So pull, uh, uh, check in, I run my automated tests, I do a pull request, the developer approves it. Once the developer approves it, it does system tests again. Once the system tests uh, happen again, the code goes in. The developer's on watch to make sure that nothing happens when the, when the code gets, in, uh, gets checked in. That's the idea of continuous delivery. So I hope that wasn't convoluted, but does it make sense? For your local IT shops, I strongly recommend that you consider this. It's uh, for, especially for IT shops. What it does is it allows you to spend more of your money on engineering and less of your, mo less of your money on what I call clipboard holders. People like me who are like, walking around going, hey, how, is the, how are things going? Are you done yet? You get to spend more of your money on engineering and on design resource because you're spending less of your time on, on quality assurance and on project management and whatever. You do the feature, you check it in. Open source. So the idea of open source is still alive and well. We embrace it. We love it. It's a core, core part of our value proposition. But the idea of open source has changed a little bit. Originally, the idea of open source was about control, working together, doing code, the virtuous cycle of everyone working on code and having one glorious code base for everybody. That idea is changing a little bit with the new Kuali so that open source is more a risk mitigation factor. So that you've got somebody, an entity, who's hiring developers, who's coordinating development, and coming up with one code base that everyone leverages and uses APIs. But, you're not beholden to this vendor because you can always take the code and run it yourself. You can take your data and run it yourself. Does that make sense? So it's, what we're doing is open source is moving from a control mechanism to a risk mitigation mechanism. Make sense? Any questions? Okay. So let me go through each of the products at a very, very high level. Kuali Student, we're building an entire student information system. We're doing it in best of breed format. So we're building a set of indi individual services. This is the team that's working on the system and that's, that's just the team that's dedicated to student and I dedicate probably right now 80 or 90% of my time to student. So this is the team that's dedicated to student. We have a whole host of operations people and other people who are also helping with the student project. So the current customers, these are the current, current customers. So University of Maryland was one of the, the schools that helped us design the system. They are not continuing forward with the enrollment part. These customers are the University of Hawaii system, University of Toronto, the Coventry system, which is four schools in Coventry, um, Northwest University, and Stellenbosch University in South Africa. So those are the design partners. So we meet with the design partners on a daily or a weekly basis, at least every week, at least twice a week with each partner. We also have signed two new cloud customers, um, Southern New Hampshire University and University of Washington. Those have both happened in the last few weeks. We'll make a, a couple more announcements in the next few weeks. It's just the interest is, is really great in our curriculum management product. So what is that product? We see this as the entire student information suite. Admissions, the financial stuff, like student accounts and financial aid. Think of student accounts as the ability to track uh, tuition payments and book payments and, and that kind of thing. Registr uh, course offering and program offering, course registration and program registration. And then the approvals for getting courses and programs approved. 
planning. The idea of planning is this is the piece that allows your students to plan both their individual schedule as well as their long-term career, academic career. And then workflow and groups for, for all of these things, okay? The first product that we've shipped is called curriculum management. It's those boxes. Courses and programs and the approvals for those, those courses and programs and the workflow for them. Again, if you haven't seen the curriculum management, if you're not involved in student, just go see it and, and you know, ask your registrar to talk to us because it's a great, it's a great product. The value proposition of curriculum management is it simplifies courses and program, program approvals because the workflow is all configurable. The forms are completely flexible, so you have the ability to change the forms any way you want to. So all of the fields, 100% of the fields on the forms are configurable, literally 100%. If, you want the, if your courses are crazy and you have some weird way of doing it, let's say you don't have the notion of credit hours at all in your university. You can make the forms reflect that. If you don't use learning outcomes, or if you do use learning outcomes, that's completely configurable. You have a, a central repository for all your courses and programs, and it's very fast search. So the ability to look them up, it's, it's super quick, and it'll generate a catalog for you. So just this is a little progress report. We built a, a fantastic team. It's a world-class team that's working on the product right now. We created easy visual workflow. As I mentioned, the configurable forms, we shipped the first product, and we've added our first two new customers to the original. So this is our roadmap. So the, the, this, the way we do roadmaps, will, you'll, it'll be consistent from product to product. We talk about what the, the next quarter will bring and what the next 12 months will bring. So the next quarter, we're working on mock-ups for enrollment. I showed a lot of those yesterday morning in the enrollment session. We have a lot more to come in the next month. So we're doing the mock-ups right now. We'll probably start development in earnest at the end of December, but realistically probably January, um, and more reports. So we've got a great analytics tool. We're just cranking out more reports based on what our customers are looking for. In the next 12 months, we're doing what's called a skeleton version. So in curriculum management, we created a skeleton version we're changing the way that we did that a little bit. Originally, when we created the skeleton version, it was a very thin slice of the entire curriculum management product. It was 100% throwaway code on purpose, and then we redeveloped it. We decided that this time, we would build the skeleton product, but it would be real code. Tested, automated tests with the real code. So the idea is that in the next 12 months, we'll have a skeleton version of enrollment of the complete course offering, program offering, course registration, program registration. So that will be available in the next 12 months. Um, the schedule for when we'll be completely finished, I'm not committing to a schedule right now. We've probably, will come out with that schedule in the next month um, and we'll be able to tell you when we'll have enrollment done. Any questions about student? Hi, I'm just thinking, like some of your other products, they seem mostly centered around U.S. customers. How are you taking into the differences between the various nations involved? So you have, you know, Canada, South Africa, U.K., and the States. It's a big difference in terms of the Azure education system works and other legal issues and such like that. How are you taking that into account? Uh, let me repeat the question. I think what you're asking is we have a lot of varied partners. How are we making sure that we have features that s support all the geographies and sizes? Uh, I, I, this is the, the group that we have is, in, is as diverse as you can imagine. You've got the Hawaii system that has community colleges and, and uh, big universities. You've got Toronto, which is extraordinarily complex internally because they've got lots of different kinds of departments and they have very uh, uh, both hierarchical and matrix governance structures. You've got South Africa, which is it's, the, the way South Africa does things is completely different in many ways to the way they're done in the United States. In the UK, in UK is pretty similar to South Africa. For example, um, uh, you sign up for a program, and once you sign up for a program, you're told what courses you're going to take. Whereas in the United States, you sign up for a program, you're given a list of courses, you decide when you want to take them. Well, imagine creating software that works for both of those. Now we have Southern New Hampshire University, and Southern New Hampshire University is very, very focused on competencies and outcomes. So we've had to create a system that supports all of those. So I think your question is, how did we do that? When we first started off, we started to define the forms for all of the, of the customers. So we defined a course form, and we were forcing like as much as possible. Let's do the same thing. 
Let's, the same fields, come on, can't you just agree on what cross-listing means? Let's, let's all use the same term cross-listing. And uh, do you really need that extra field? And as we went down that path, we realized that the term special snowflake was real and okay. It's okay in some cases to be a special snowflake because your university is unique. Why should we, a software vendor, force you to drive internal change for something that doesn't matter for the sake of saying that we're the same? Now, I'm not saying that we shouldn't have best practices. We should absolutely have best practices. But it's more important for us to create a configurable tool that allows people to create things the way they want. So the way that we do that is we use what's called gadgets. On a form, you can drop gadgets onto the form. So there's a learning outcomes gadget. If you don't use learning outcomes, you don't have the learning outcomes gadget on your form. We also put flexibility into the gadgets. So for example, in some cases, somebody has a learning outcome and they want to categorize the learning outcome. In some cases, they don't. So you could just turn that on or off. In some cases, they want subject codes to be governed, meaning you can't type in a new subject code. You have to use one from a list. In some cases, they want subject codes to be ungoverned, where you can type in whatever subject code you want. Different universities have different requirements. In some cases, the subject code is mandatory to be submitted into workflow. In some cases, the subject code doesn't get entered until the third node in workflow. So in all those cases, we just realized the only way to do this is to create a configurable tool. So that's what we've created. Workflow, completely configurable. Fields, completely configurable. Even the object types, courses, programs, experiences, field trips, dissertations, all configurable. Does that answer your question? Yeah. Even the titles of things, even the titles of things are configurable. For example, the idea of a course, does, a course in the UK is a program in the United States. So we allow them to rename courses to modules. In South Africa, same thing. They don't have the idea of a course for an individual uh, a class. It's, um, I, uh, it's, they use the term module also. Is there another question? And the modules for students, I didn't see academic history or grading or degree processing or anything like that. Is that part of enrollment or is that still to come? Uh, did you say degree processing? Degree processing, academic history, um, uh, grading, et cetera? Yes, thank you. That's a great question. We see academic, the, sort of the academic record as part of enrollment, per se, but we're doing that second. So enough of our partners would roll out enrollment, um, course offering program offering, course registration program registration, without the academic record piece, that we're going to do that first. As soon as we do it, they're going to be able to integrate it, and we'll come out with the academic record piece later. Um, th so that's how we do everything is we do it in individual pieces that can be rolled out. Um, so if, if it can be cut into a small piece, we do it. But yes, that's part of what we'll do, and we consider that to be part of enrollment, but not part of this initial skeleton. Okay, other questions about student? Joel, the one question I have is, when do you think you will be around to setting a schedule as to when you think you're going to have the rest of these modules done? So the rest, so... Um, Thanks, Lynn. Uh, for enrollment, we'll have a schedule for enrollment, course offering, course registration, program offering, program registration by the end of this year. So um, I'm hoping for the end of November, uh, but at least by the end of this year. The rest of the modules, we're not going to have a schedule. And the reason for that is because I think um, if you look at our competitor schedules and you, and you look at their ability to execute to the schedules, they are 100% wrong in all cases. And we don't want to do that. We don't want to come out and say, this is when we're going to ship it, when we know it's bogus. So uh, that probably is not very popular, but we're just trying to be honest that I don't know when we're going to have financial aid done. I don't know when we're going to have student accounts done. It just, it's, it's uh, too, it's too, there are too many variables. It's calculus. But what you can do is you can look at how long it took us to get curriculum management done. So curriculum management is available now for people to use. Now there's some features we haven't finished yet for partner pilots that we're working on, but we can roll out schools right now on the curriculum management product. We started in January. So enrollment, once we tell you the schedule for enrollment, you'll be able to start to infer how long it takes us to do modules and you can kind of kind of connect the dots. But a, a complete student information system from start to finish is not, We'll have the whole thing done in two to four years. That's about as good as I can say. Any other questions? 
is that okay? I mean, is it okay that I just say, I don't know? Instead of just saying, oh, I can tell you, it's 43 months. Brad? So in, in thinking about the timeline for getting to a complete student system, is that just how long it takes irrespective of money or if 10 universities stood up and say, gosh, we've really got to have this and we want to come on board and here's some money to put with it, would it dramatically change that timeline or would it not? So if you would have asked me that a year ago, I would have told you, in fact, you did ask me that a year ago, and I told you that new, more money would not increase our pace in the, in the first year. And that's because we've been building a company culture and hiring people and an executive team and figuring out how we're going to do development. Now, I would say that's different. Like if I had several schools that came to us right now and said, I want financial aid immediately, we would spin up a parallel project and we would go start working on financial aid right now. If we had several schools that wanted to work on an, a library system right now, we would work on a library system. If, so there are some, some things that we can parallelize and some we can't. Like if you said, I want to speed up academic record, I can't speed that up. I have to do enrollment to do academic record. But financial aid, yes. Student accounts, yes. The planning tool, probably not. So, so uh, that was a long-winded answer, but yes, certain things we could parallelize. Same for HR. Okay, back to the slides. So this is the financials team. The reason I put this slide is this is the financials team. These are the people that were involved in the original community for financials that are now, they were paid for by the project and now, that now they're paid for as either full-time quality employees or contractors. These are the new people that we've brought in from outside. So we've added a ton of external expertise. We've almost, well, I guess we've more than doubled the team with outside expertise. These are new interaction design, operating data people, um, operating center people. So a lot of really, really good uh, uh, people have been added to the project, as well as a lot of great people who are already on the project. These are the customers that are currently using the product, again, either in the cloud or um, on premise. This is the product. So I'm not going to go through these individually, but what I want you to take away from this is if you're not using the current Koali Financials product, it is a very, very robust product. If I were to categorize the problem with the product, I'd say it's two things. The first thing is there's a lack of great analytics. We are fixing that. So we've come up with a new analytics tool that is fantastic, and we're integrating that in with the product. In addition, um, user experience. So the user experience is subpar. It's, there are little performance problems, and the user experience isn't fast enough. Um, so I'm going to talk about that in a minute. But to me, those are the big two things. Now, there are things that can be improved, like the expense reporting piece. It's not great. So there are a couple options. Use it the way it is. You go with somebody like Concur, which is fine. Some of our schools are deciding to go with a, a third-party company. or wait for us to develop a new module, and we will be developing a new module for expense reporting, and it'll be awesome. <laughs> it's twice. L luckily, Nat's not here. Brad. I, I'd like to share a comment that I, I cut from my remarks this morning, but I think it's appropriate for, for folks who may be new to Kuali and understanding what it means to have systems that were written uh, and designed by higher ed and, and all the things that we need. Uh, I'll back up a few years ago at Indiana University. We're eight campuses, and then but we under one governance and all, and ended up a little bit crossways me personally with my CFO in a debate about how we wanted to handle some financial matters across multiple campuses, but needing a consolidated view of it. And it wasn't, you know, really just a reporting thing. And this this really got pretty serious and pretty heated that the way we were organizing the university was not the way it was being reported, but the way it was being reported was essential for another financial constraint that that office had. So she and I are in a fairly substantial debate uh, about this and the merits of, of it and all. And finally, of course, we asked Sterling, George, I don't know if Sterling's here or not, he helped design the financial system with the community here, and Sterling goes, oh, KFS, it can handle that. There's an attribute for it. It'll do it both ways right now. And we didn't even, neither of us being involved with the creation of it, but I think that's an example of what happens when a system that had really been thought through by so many different financial professionals, we didn't have to do a customization, we didn't have to you know, write something different. It was innate in the, the very core DNA of the system. Yep, thank you. 
A couple of other things that I think are important in that kind of configurable uh, vein. The other thing that we're trying to do that, that maybe we haven't done, we've done a little bit, but not as well as we could have in the past, is making sure that our products are accessible, that they're internationalizable, um, and that they're configurable from a reporting standpoint. So like in the cloud, for example, and you're, you're, uh, we, we offer all, we will either are currently doing or will soon, as in a few months, not years, offer fully read-only relational reporting databases for all of our products, and that's included in the price of the cloud. So you have a JDBC driver on top of the relational database, you stick Tableau on top of it, or you put Excel or whatever relational reporting tool you want to on top of this database, and you've got whatever reporting tool you want. In addition to that, we're adding individual reports into the product itself so that you can add those reports. For on-premise customers, we're creating out-of-the-box canned reports because you're, it's your choice how you want to do your relational database. So we're adding those canned reports that you'll hook up to whatever data source that you're, that you're planning to use. The international piece is a really important piece for us as well. So a student from the very beginning was written with international in mind. We're also talking to several customers, both in South Africa, but also in the UK. At, at Educause, we had people from New Zealand, Australia, Belgium, France, all over, who are talking to us about how do we, uh, how do we make the product more internationalizable, and that's gonna be a focus for us. The more we make it internationalizable, the more configurable it is in, gen in, in general, and that's gonna benefit everybody to make it more configurable. Best fit for higher ed, these are, oh, please. Can you explain a little bit, because the KFS was written, um, you know, in different pieces, and so we deal with the fact that, you know, CAMS is a little bit different than um, accounts payable and all that. Can you talk a little bit about how you're going to, how the new version is going to be a little bit more seamless, like under the covers? Um, yes. Instead of... Uh, these little pieces that were all written by different Java developers? Yes. Um, let me think of the best metaphor uh, that I can think of. Okay. This is a weird metaphor. I'm being recorded. Okay. Um, the imagine code, you've heard the term spaghetti code, right? Imagine, um, imagine looking at KFS as a bowl of spaghetti. And this is not to denigrate KFS, this is all projects. You look at your code and it's spaghetti. And the reason why you, it's, combined, it's compared to spaghetti code is that if you want to pull a piece of spaghetti out, you start to pull it out and the string is going to go all the way through. It's going to have implications throughout the whole thing. And that's how code is today. Anytime you have monolithic code, if I make a change here, all of a sudden there's a change over there that I wasn't aware of. Okay, so that's the problem we're trying to solve. The way that we solve that problem is that we just surgically take that piece of spaghetti out and we kind of roll it into a little piece on its own. And that's called componentizing the product. So we're creating a set of microservices and we're doing it one little bit at a time. So we do that in kind of two ways. The first way is like with a module like conflict of interest. Conflict of interest we wrote completely from scratch. It's on the new stack, and it talks to the monolithic application. So when we do a big new module like that, we just write it, we just develop it in a microservice kind of architecture from the very beginning. But if you're talking about something that's already deeply embedded, what we do is we take that piece of spaghetti out and we componentize it. And, and, and we're not doing that like five years from now, we're doing it right now. So when we go work on some piece of the product, We'll, at the same time that we're developing the new functionality, we'll try and componentize it and create this little individual microservice as much as possible. That whole thing is gonna take us, so last year when I said it was gonna take us three to five years, I didn't mean we weren't gonna do any work on financials or research for three to five years. You've seen, we've done a lot of work. It's that it's gonna take us three to five years to componentize it so that you don't have the spaghetti, the spaghetti problem. Did that answer your question? Any other questions? Uh, yes, the analytics we're going to add to KFS. So um, have any of you been to the analytics session with Matt? Oh, just a few of you? 
wow, if you get a chance, go to Matt's analytics session. Um, we have a third party tool. So let me talk about cloud, let me talk about on-premise. Um, with analytics, 80% of the work for us, maybe even 90% of the work for us, is in transforming the data to be reportable, okay? So you don't wanna run your reports off your operational system. You wanna run your reports off a database which is optimized for reporting, both from a schema standpoint, a naming standpoint. You don't wanna do a report and have like TBL underscore OJ4 show up. You want it to say accounts or pay, uh, payments. Does that make sense? So 90% of the work is for us to put that data into a relational format. So we have an analytics team that's totally focused on doing that. So they take the data across all the products and they create a relational version of the data that's optimized for reporting. So for our cloud customers, we host that database for you. It's totally relational, it's read only, and again, you can put whatever tool you want on top of it. We have a tool that we include as part of the price which ha of, of cloud that has a bunch of canned reports. And those canned reports have widgets that you can dial, you know, choose, change the date, change the fields, whatever. Does that make sense? For on-premise customers, we'll release the schema. So the same tool that we use in order to transform the data from our operational store to the relational store, we'll make the schema available to you. We can't actually transform it for you because we don't know anything about your database. You've, you've optimized it and customized it. But we can provide the tool that we use to move our operational data to the relational database, that we can give to you. And then you'll be able to customize it and do whatever you want with it. Our third party tool that we use for reporting that's a third party tool that we resell, so we can't give that to you. So we'll tell you who the product is. You can go do a deal with them if you want. But what we're also doing is 90% of the work is creating the relational database. Creating the reports is easy for us. So what we're doing is, is we're taking the most popular reports and we're just building them. So you won't have to go to a tool necessarily. You'll have canned reports that we'll release to you that'll just be reports that you can use on premise. Does that make sense? And as we build those reports, we'll put those in the cloud version as well. So they'll be available, our own custom built reports will be available in the cloud as well as on premise. For cloud customers, you'll also have this third party tool for, for reporting that's kind of nice. And you can use that same third party retool, just go talk to the vendor for yourself if you want. Okay, streamlined audits for financials. I'm not gonna go into a ton of data because the product team is gonna go through this. We built a world-class product team. We've really improved the user experience. We've, we've replaced about 30% of the screens with a brand new look and feel that looks really nice. Um, implemented continuous delivery, so we're removing the state from the financial product and we're making it so that every time we make a change, it goes into our cloud offering automatically. Um, We've created a new uh, configurable dashboard that Eileen will talk about, and we've started to do common baseline work, trying to get everyone to the same baseline. This is the roadmap. I'm not gonna spend a ton of time on this because Eileen will be talking about it. Any other questions about financials? I'm gonna scurry through this because I think the questions are more valuable. Is that okay? Quality research. Let me just explain at a high level what, well, this is the team for quality research. This is the team that we hired out of the community. This is the team that we added from, uh, from outside. Uh, this is just a sampling of the research customers. So let me explain at a high level what the research product is. The research administration product is a product that allows you to track your compliance to the grants that you're applying for. So you can, I'm gonna apply for this grant. It's everything sort of from cradle to grave with all the, the proposal process, negotiation, and award. So it, it includes, it's the only comprehensive suite of products. It includes conflict of interest, IACUC, IRB. Um, it's sort of the whole suite of, of, for, for research. It's a, gr it's a great product. Now, there are parts of the product that don't have the best user experience or slower than they need to be. So we're fixing those. And we've, we've been working with MIT in order to fix that, you know, they're kind of the, the mother of all implementations because they've got a very complex um, uh, sort of a lot of transactions running through the system. So they're helping us find and fix a lot of bugs, some of which you would have never seen because you're not as complex as them. Still, they're helping us find and fix a lot of those bugs in their implementation. About 12.9 billion in annual research expenditures go through our systems. It's proposals and awards and compliance. 
it's, well, this is the cool thing about the product. It is the single source of comprehensive research data from conflict of interest through, through all the proposals. These are some of the, the great things that have happened last year. We built an amazing team, much better user experience, which will continue to get better, a brand new COI module. We have continuous delivery. We're shipping several times a week, new functionality. We've added five new research customers, cloud research customers, with several more that we'll announce in the, in the next month or so. MIT has gone live, and we're working with them to make the product even better. Any questions about research? Yes. Uh, how much will it interface with financials? The question is, uh, how much will research interface with financials? Uh, we see, it depends on if you mean short term or long term. Long term, it's a set of independent core services that will all talk to each other. So financials, for example, um, there should only be one general ledger. There should only be one account list. There should only be one employee list. There should, you know, all of these things should be independent services. So those independent services, the products will be made up of those independent services. So the answer is a ton, and uh, we'll get there incrementally a little bit at a time. Good question. Thank you. This is the roadmap. There's been some talk about us wanting to do proposal development. Um, the KCC right now, or the project, the project governance for research, has suggested that they, it's more important to them to focus on IRB and IACUC right now than it is to focus on a new prop, uh, proposal development. But we'll eventually replace proposal development. I know there's been talk about putting together a parallel project with new funding to fix proposal development. We'd love to talk about that because I, because I know a lot of you, half of you, really want us to work on proposal development. So. I think that, that talk is starting to happen. Any other questions about research? Yes. What about a general timeline for a week for um, a, a general timeline for what? Award, the award module. Dave, do you want to talk to that? Um, well, just like Joel talked about earlier, the roadmap for those things out beyond 12 months are more difficult. And I, it's really uh, has been set by the community that basically the award module is primarily the back office tool, and those that are faculty facing have been identified as being more important in the short term. <coughs> so all I can really say is that they'll be done. Awards will be addressed um, after proposal development currently. Good. So there's one thing I should say, that, I, that this has not been clear to people in the past, but it, it also depends on how many cloud customers we sign. So for example, in the next month and a half, we'll announce two, hopefully we'll announce, two really, really large cloud customers for research. We take that money and we reinvest it in developers and designers. So every time we sign a new cloud customer, we are reinvesting because we end up getting paid more because you're spending less on development. You're spending less overall, but we take that money and reinvest it in research and development that benefits everybody. So the more cloud customers, so, uh, so part of the answer is, I don't know. If we sign up more cloud customers, the whole thing accelerates because we start to create more parallel teams. Prop Dev is a perfect example of something we could do in parallel with iCook and IRB. IRB and, I, and iCook should be done together but we could do a, have a separate team completely working on prop dev and do it in parallel. Okay, let's talk about Quali Ready. So Quali Ready is, um, I think there's, I think there are probably not many of you that are using Quali Ready on premise. It's an ideal product to be run in the cloud. One of the reasons you want to run Quali Ready in the cloud is because it's a business continuity planning product. And by definition, it's something you want to make sure is still working if there's something wrong with your system, if your network is down or whatever. So that's why almost all customers come to us and run it in the cloud. And I think it's for foundation partners. Jen, how much is it for foundation partners? 8,000 8, for a year for foundation partners. And for non-foundation partners, it's 11,000 per year. It's a very inexpensive uh, a product, but it's a super valuable product. We have about 85 customers that are using Kowali Ready in the cloud today. It was originally written by Berkeley, um, and we've completely rewritten it from the ground up. It's, it's, a, it's got a nice mobile experience. It's got a drag and drop experience. And the value proposition is it allows you to facilitate the creation of your plans 
for in the event of, of some kind of problem, whether it's a hurricane or a data center uh, blows up or any kind of sort of emergency, it facilitates the creation of your plans, the maintenance of those plans over time, because everyone who does business continuity planning understands that those plans, you go through a big roundup, you get the plans in place, and then they're out of date in five minutes. So it's the maintenance of those plans, and then the execution of the plans in the event of a response. So it's a product that's optimized for that. So that's something if you want to kind of, if you're new here and you want to kind of get a taste for what the cloud is like, I suggest you put your business continuity or emergency planning people in touch with us, and we explore using uh, uh, Ready in your institutions. It's designed uniquely for higher ed. It's not a general purpose business continuity planning tool. It's unique for, for higher ed. It allows you to maintain your business operations during disruptions. It improves your organizational res resilience. So it allows you to get back on track quickly and prepare for that so that you're not kind of wondering what to do in the case of an emergency. And one, an important thing here is there's more than one type of emergency. You're going to respond differently to a pandemic than you're going, going to respond to a shooter on campus. And this, this tool allows you to kind of differentiate and create your plans for the different types of events that might happen. It also allows you to reduce your administrative overload dramatically because so much of this is now automated. Um, let me say this. One of the biggest problems we see with business continuity planning, biggest problem, I think Jen would attest to this, is that you've got business continuity planning officers, people in your institution who care a lot about this, and they don't get any support. So it's something that we, I want to appeal to you, especially if you're in IT, figure out ways, or anybody, figure out ways to support your business continuity planning people, because the time to plan is before the event and not after. Um, and this is a product that helps you do that. In the, last, uh, in the last year, we've launched a new product completely uh, built from scratch. There's a push-button conversion to the new product. So if you want to migrate, if you're on the old product and you want to migrate to the new one, you push a button and it migrates for you. Um, we've added seven new institutions recently. I think that might actually be eight now. Um, and we've launched a, a great help portal. Uh, Jen Dalby's done a really fantastic job of creating a help portal for customers to help themselves. We'll be using that same portal technology for all of our products. It's a, it's a really nice uh, product. This is our roadmap, and I'll answer any questions about Ready. I think we're out of time. Questions about Ready? Okay. Thank you. Um, re uh, related to the uh, continuous delivery, uh, so my understanding that basically your um, continuous delivery that's now offered for the cloud customers, what about the open source? Currently for KC, we get the monthly releases. Yeah. So do you see that it's going to change? So we, because I see there, there would be a gap between the uh, cloud customers versus the on-premise in, in terms of adding features and they get it right away versus waiting a month to get the new features? Yeah. The question is, right now we have continuous delivery where we ship a couple of times a week for the research product, but we're shipping what we're you know, putting together a monthly release. The, the releases for research used to be annual. And so we've moved that into monthly. And we've talked about doing it more frequently, but frankly, the customers have said, please don't. I'm not on the latest version now. I don't want to choose between Tuesday's release and Friday's release and Monday's release. Monthly is plenty. So if we had customers that were coming to us saying, please give us every single release you ever do, we'd be happy to talk about it. But most of our customers aren't on the latest version of the code anyway, and monthly is just fine. So if that's a problem, you should talk to Dave and Terry about it, and we'd love to, to explore it. But frankly, honestly, we've had more customers ask us to do it l less frequently than monthly who are, who are asking us to do it more frequently than monthly. Because otherwise, every time we release, your developers are going, oh, let me dig into all the new stuff every day because we're releasing so, so frequently. OK, I'm sorry we're out of time, but they're, uh, just wrap it up or take one more. OK, thank you very much. Please attend the product sessions if you're interested, and we appreciate you being here at Quality Days.